Okay, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about the Watergate crisis and sort of the downfall of Nixon's administration. So as we talked about in class, um, Nixon is not that bad of a president, at least at first. He, you know, is doing some good things, especially in foreign policy. Um, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes that a lot of people don't really know about. So that's kind of what we're going to get in today. So the election of 1972 uh, is Nixon versus George McGovern. Now, Nixon is absolutely paranoid that he's going to lose this election. Um, he really believes that there are people that are out to get him. He is completely delusional. Um, when, in fact, Nixon is quite a popular president. Um, he's almost certainly going to win re-election. But he wants to make absolutely sure, right? So he's going to do everything he can to make sure he does not lose this election. Um, so there is a break-in, right? And at the time, it is thought that this is just his supporters. Um, so there's a group called the Committee to Re-elect the President, or abbreviated as CREEP, which is going to become kind of ironic. Um, so Nixon supporters of CREEP break in to McGovern's uh, headquarters, which are located in the Watergate Hotel and they are spying on the Democrats' campaign. So they're basically looking to see how they're running, what they're going to say against Nixon, all this kind of good stuff. Um, and these guys are caught, right? Um, so the break-in happens. Nixon claims he knew nothing, right? He said that it was all them. I had nothing to do with it. Don't know what this is all about. We're going to make sure that we find out exactly what happened and who's in charge and who under whose authority they did this. And he's just, you know, he's going to make sure that we figure this out, right? Well, everything seems to be fine until a very secret source calls up these two reporters, Woodward and Bernstein. And basically he says, I've got this secret information and my job is in danger if I try to tell you. So you can't reveal my name. He gives him like a code name. And they, I mean, it's straight out of a movie. They go and meet in a parking garage in the middle of the night. And he's like, hey, so not only did Nixon like know about the break-in, he helped cover it up. He was trying to help the cover up. Whoa, whoa, this just story just blows everything out of the water. You're telling me the president was involved in a cover-up? That's huge, right? So the Senate begins hearings. Um, and they're actually led by a North Carolina politician uh, named Sam Irwin. And in these hearings, they are, you know, interviewing different members of Nixon's campaign. And John Dean, who's part of Nixon's campaign, comes forward and says, yes, Nixon authorized the cover-up, right? I mean, this is... This is fact, right? Like, this is mind-blowing that the president is proven that his staff knew that he knew about this cover-up, right? And the American people are just completely thrown off, right? This is a guy who was really popular. He just won this major election, right? And this is brand new information. So another White House aide reveals that the Oval Office conversations are audio taped, that Nixon audio tapes every single person and every single thing that's ever said in the Oval Office. And so the Senate hearing says, well, we got to hear these tapes, right? You got to turn these tapes over. And Nixon says, no, I'm not going to turn the tapes over because I have something called executive privilege as a president. I'm above the law. I don't have to give you these tapes. I can do whatever I want. Wait, what? Well, what he argued is that on the tapes, there was sensitive information, right? Things that the American people didn't need to know, things about foreign policy, things about how we were dealing with it. So he refuses to hand over the tapes. Well, now there's a big question, like, wait a minute. Are you not handing over the tapes because you know we're going to find something out? We know that you're not innocent, right? Maybe, huh? So um, U.S., the Supreme Court, sues President Nixon. So think about this. The Supreme Court sues the sitting president. That's huge. So the Supreme Court says, Nixon, you do not have executive privilege. You do not have the right to turn over these tapes, right? Or you have the right. You have to turn over these tapes. And so they do. And they kind of play around it, you know. In the end, the tapes are turned over. 
And what the American people find out is that Nixon is not that nice of a guy. He says really nasty things about women, and he's really profane, like he's dropping F-bombs left and right. And the American people are shocked. But not only that, parts of the tape had been erased. That's certainly convenient, right? It was just a total mistake by one of our secretaries who actually hit the wrong button by accident. And like this whole section just got erased. Like, oops, we don't know what happened. And they had just so happened to have been talking about Watergate. Yikes, it looks like Nixon intentionally destroyed any evidence that he might have been talking about Watergate. Uh-oh. I mean, this is, this is super controversial. Well, basically by this point, there is enough evidence that President Nixon is going to be impeached and possibly forced out of office. And they were starting the impeachment process. But Nixon, not wanting to go to trial and not wanting to be impeached, says, you know what? I'm going to resign. He becomes the first ever sitting president to ever resign from office. Um, here is a copy of his resignation letter, August 9th, 1974. Dear Mr. Secretary, I hereby resign the office of President of the United States. Sincerely, Richard M. Nixon. It's huge, right? And the American people no longer can trust their government, right? This is so out there, right? So this is just a quote um, from uh, a newspaper uh, writer, James Kilpatrick. He says, the lies, the lies, the lies. What a pity, what a pity. Here was a president who got us out of Vietnam, ended the draft, and by his bold overtures to Red China, opened up new avenues towards world peace. And now the good vanishes in the wreckage of the bad. The swearing in of Gerald Ford can't come soon enough. Um, so Gerald Ford is going to become the new president. So Gerald Ford was vice president. But here's the catch. Gerald Ford is actually never elected. Uh, vice President Agnew, who had been the uh, vice president who'd been elected under Nixon, resigned because he had been accepting bribes. This went on during the whole Watergate scandal. So Gerald Ford had been appointed vice president. So Ford becomes president, having never been elected to either the presidency or the vice presidency. He is our only ever non-elected president. Kind of weird, right? Um, so here I actually have a newspaper which I'll show you guys again in class, um, which is from Greensboro, that is Ford Takes Office. And if you look through this paper, the whole thing is about the Watergate scandals. You can see there's some articles down here. Um, the swearing in happened um, on August 9th, right? 18, 1974. Um, so this is a really big deal, right? It happens immediately following the resignation of Nixon. Uh, so... That sums up the Watergate scandal. We're going to go a little bit more detail into it in class, um, but I hope that gave you a good overview. Um, the thing to get from this is that really this is one of the biggest scandals that ever happens um, in the White House, and that's pretty, it's pretty big. It has a major effect on the American people and their feeling towards the presidency and all of that. Um, so anyway, I will catch you guys later. Bye-bye.